for the hardest hitting show in talk radio. The true progressive voice since 2012. This is South Pause. And welcome to South Paws on the Pacifica Radio Network. We are the leaders of the revolution. My name is Darren Gibson, and I'm your co-host. And I'm Katie Steele Baroni for Jack Prince. Yes, thank you so much again for joining me this week. I really appreciate it. Always uh, a pleasure. Another hello to Jack out there. I talked to him earlier this week, uh, trying to convince him to try and come back on the air. We'll see <laughs> how that works. Miss you, Jack. Yes, you are very sadly missed here, but... I'm glad you're here because we've got a couple of things to talk about today. I'm just going to skip the introductions. You know how to follow us on social media and you can, uh, you know where to listen to us. Uh, make sure you uh, subscribe at iTunes at the iTunes store, Apple podcast. If you enjoy the show, please give us a five star rating that helps us, uh, with getting more publicity, getting out there a little higher in the search engines and everything like that so we would appreciate five star ratings when it gets to the point that i'm going to start advertising this then that'll help as well but in the meantime (laughs) i am in one of those moods today yes he is and (laughs) folks you're gonna want to hide the children from this episode because there's probably going to be a lot of bleeps in it Because right now, there are three words that I'm thinking of to describe everybody who works for Facebook. And that's the three of the seven dirty words that George Carlin used in his routine. The seven dirty words you can't say on television. Which, by the way, since we're on Pacifica Radio, that's a historic court case where Pacifica got sued for playing the seven dirty words routine Ah. on the radio uncensored and got in (laughs) big trouble for it. So, yeah, the three of the seven dirty words I'm thinking of, two of them start with C and one begins with M and has four syllables. So why am I so mad at Facebook? Well, it's because Facebook has banned me for three days for violation of terms of service for spreading coronavirus misinformation. That is what they told me when they put the ban on me. So what was it that I posted? I posted to the South Paws page, and you know where to find it. Just search for us on Facebook, South Paws Radio Show. I posted the complete text of a press release that I received on Tuesday from the University of California, San Francisco. We have had members of University of California, San Francisco as guests on this show in the past. We've talked about medical issues with them. They do a lot of medical research there. This was a release that I got on August 11, 2020, and it was labeled for immediate release. And I'm going to read the headline. Aeronabs promise powerful, inhalable protection against COVID-19. I'm going to read this in its entirety here, so please bear with me. As the world awaits vaccines to bring the COVID-19 pandemic under control, University of California San Francisco scientists have devised a novel approach to halting the spread of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes the disease. Led by UCSF graduate student Michael Schuf a team of researchers engineered a completely synthetic, production-ready molecule that straightjackets the crucial SARS-CoV-2 machinery that allows the virus to infect our cells. As reported in a new paper, now available on the preprint server BioRxiv, experiments using live virus show that the molecule is among the most potent SARS-CoV-2 antivirals yet discovered. In an aerosol formulation they tested, dubbed Aeronabs by the researchers, these molecules could be self-administered with a nasal spray or an inhaler. 
Used once a day, AeroNabs could provide powerful, reliable protection against SARS-CoV-2 until a vaccine becomes available. The research team is in active discussions with commercial partners to ramp up manufacturing and clinical testing of AeroNabs. If these tests are successful, the scientists aim to make AeroNabs widely available as an inexpensive over-the-counter medication to prevent and treat COVID-19. Well, mm-hmm. I, I think that makes some agendas pretty clear. Um, you know, it sounds to me like Facebook has some sort of interest in whatever vaccine they're developing, right? I mean, why else would you be trying to hide information like this, I guess? Mm-hmm. I'm going to continue here. Aeronab's co-inventor Peter Walter, Ph.D., professor of biochemistry and biophysics at UCSF, and a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator said, quote, far more effective than wearable forms of personal protective equipment, we think of AeroNabs as a molecular form of PPE that could serve as an important stopgap until vaccines provide a more permanent solution to COVID-19, end of quote. For those who cannot access or don't respond to SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, Walter added, Aeronabs could be a more permanent line of defense against COVID-19. Michael Schuf, a member of the Walter Lab and an Aeronabs co-inventor, said, quote, We assembled an incredible group of talented biochemists, cell biologists, virologists, and structural biologists to get the project from start to finish in only a few months, end of quote. Though engineered entirely in the lab, Aeronabs were inspired by nanobodies, antibody-like immune proteins that naturally occur in llamas, camels, and related animals. Since their discovery in a Belgian lab in the late 1980s, the distinctive properties of nanobodies have intrigued scientists worldwide. Co-inventor Ashish Manglik, MD, PhD, and assistant professor of pharmaceutical chemistry, who frequently employs nanobodies as a tool in his research on the structure and function of proteins that send and receive signals across the cell's membrane, explained it this way, quote, Though they function much like the antibodies found in the human immune system, nanobodies offer a number of unique advantages for effective therapeutics against SARS-CoV-2, end of quote. For example, nanobodies are an order of magnitude smaller than human antibodies, which makes them easier to manipulate and modify in the lab. Their small size and relatively simple structure also makes them significantly more stable than the antibodies of other mammals. Plus, unlike human antibodies, nanobodies can be easily and inexpensively mass-produced. Scientists insert the genes that contain the molecular blueprints to build nanobodies into E. coli or yeast, and transform these microbes into high-output nanobody factories. The same method has been used safely for decades to mass-produce insulin. But as Manglick noted, quote, nanobodies were just the starting point for us. Though appealing on their own, we thought we could improve upon them through protein engineering. This eventually led to the development of aeronabs, end of quote. SARS-CoV-2 relies on its so-called spike proteins to infect cells. These spikes stud the surface of the virus and impart a crown-like appearance when viewed through an electron microscope, hence the name coronavirus for the viral family that includes SARS-CoV-2. Spikes, however, are more than a mere decoration. They are the essential key that allows the virus to enter our cells. Like a retractable tool, spikes can switch from a closed, inactive state to an open, active state. When any of a virus's particles, approximately 25 spikes, become active, that spike's three receptor-binding domains, or RBDs, become exposed and are primed to attach to ACE2, a receptor found on human cells that line the lung and airway. Through a lock and key-like interaction between an ACE2 receptor and a spike RBD, the virus gains entry into the cell, where it then transforms its new host into a coronavirus manufacturer. The researchers believed that if they could find nanobodies that impede spike ACE2 interactions, they could prevent the virus from infecting cells. To find effective candidates, the scientists parsed a recent developed library in Menglik's lab of over 2 billion synthetic nanobodies. After successive rounds of testing, during which they imposed increasingly stringent criteria to eliminate weak or ineffective candidates, 
The scientists ended up with 21 nanobodies that prevented a modified form of spike from interacting with ACE2. So this is science, folks. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense to me. And that's what I've heard as well, that those spikes are what help the virus attach. And the more of those cells that attach, the more severe your symptoms are with stuff like COVID. Because mm-hmm. I didn't realize that, that if you're, say, at a dinner and, you know, somebody there is actively spreading the disease and gives it or the virus and gives it to other people and you end up getting exposed to more of it, you have a more severe form of it. Mm-hmm. I did not realize that it came down to how much of it you're exposed to. So that's. Yeah. Well, yeah, that kind of makes sense here. Yeah. Let me continue real quick. Further experiments, including the use of cryo electron microscopy to visualize the nanobody spike interface, showed that the most potent nanobodies blocked spike ACE2 interactions by strongly attaching themselves directly to the spike RBDs. These nanobodies function a bit like a sheath that covers the RBD key and prevents it from being inserted into an ACE2 lock. With these findings in hand, the researchers still needed to demonstrate that these nanobodies could prevent the real virus from infecting cells. Veronica Rizels, Ph.D., a virologist in the lab of Marco Vignuzzi, Ph.D., at the Institut Pasteur in Paris, tested the three most promising nanobodies against live SARS-CoV-2 and found the nanobodies to be extraordinarily potent, preventing infection even at extremely low doses. Yeah, the Pasteur Institute, as in pasteurization people? Yeah. The most potent of these nanobodies, however, not only acts as a sheath over RBDs, but also like a molecular mousetrap, clamping down on spike in its closed, inactive state, which adds an additional layer of protection against the spike ACE2 interactions that lead to infection. The scientists then engineered this double-action nanobody in a number of ways to make it into an even more potent antiviral. In one set of experiments, they mutated every one of the amino acid building blocks of the nanobody that contacts spike to discover two specific changes that yielded a 500-fold increase in potency. In a separate set of experiments, they engineered a molecular chain that could link three nanobodies together. As noted, each spike protein has three RBDs, any of which can attach to ACE2 to grant the virus entry into the cell. So it's like you're trying to get into your house. You have three keys to get into the door. Any one of the three keys could work. So that's how that works. The linked triple nanobody devised by the researchers ensured that if one nanobody attaches itself to an RBD, the other two would attach to the remaining RBDs. They found that this triple nanobody is 200,000 times more potent than a single nanobody alone. And when they drew on the results of both modifications linking three of the powerful mutated nanobodies together, the results were, as Walter said, quote, off the charts. It was so effective that it exceeded our ability to measure its potency, end of quote. How do we get our hands on this stuff? Yeah, hopefully (laughs) soon. Uh, Let me continue. This ultra-potent three-part nanobody construct formed the foundation for aeronabs. In a final set of experiments, the researchers put the three-part nanobodies through a series of stress tests, subjecting them to high temperatures, turning them into a shelf-stable powder, and making an aerosol. Each of these processes is highly damaging to most proteins, but the scientists confirmed that, thanks to the inherent stability of nanobodies, There was no loss of antiviral potency in the aerosolized form, suggesting that aeronabs are a potent SARS-CoV-2 antiviral that could be practical to administer via a shelf-stable inhaler or nasal spray. Manglick said, quote, We're not alone in thinking that aeronabs are a remarkable technology. Our team is in ongoing discussions with potential commercial partners who are interested in manufacturing and distributing aeronabs, and we hope to commence human trials soon. If aeronabs prove as effective as we anticipate, they may help reshape the course of the pandemic worldwide. End of quote. Wow. So that's the end of the press release, but then they explain who the authors were of this paper, where the funding came from, and different disclosures, and information about the University of California, San Francisco. So... so- that article by itself 
you were accused of spreading misinformation and banned from Facebook. Mm Mm-hmm. For three days. I can't help but be just, I mean, Mm -hmm. it just seems very blatant that there's some, you know, there's something in it for, they have some interest, you know, that they're attempting to protect. What what are your thoughts that that is? Well, I don't know. I really wish I knew the answers. Nobody from Facebook will get back to me. Hell, you can't find any contact information to get a hold of oh, anybody Oh, no, you Facebook. can't. You're not supposed to be able to. I mean... Which is ridiculous. And that's actually... I'll tell you what. I'll mention it in just a little bit here. So I posted this Tuesday evening. By the way, they removed that post. So anybody that wants the press release, I'll forward it to you. Just send me your email address, and you can read it all on your own here. So they banned me Wednesday morning. By Wednesday afternoon, this popped up at Yahoo News, published by USA Today, Ah. which is owned by Gannett. Let me read this here. Headline says, scientists develop nasal spray to fight coronavirus. Researchers at the University of California, San Francisco, say they have created a nasal spray that can help ward off the coronavirus, not as a cure or vaccine, but as an antiviral. Which is better, right? I mean... (laughs) Yep. Aeronab's co-inventor Peter Walter, professor of biochemistry and biophysics at UCSF, in a news release said, quote, Far more effective than wearable forms of personal protective equipment, we think of Aeronab's as a molecular form of PPE that could serve as an important stopgap until vaccines provide a more permanent solution to COVID-19. So the same End quote the is what same, was in the article. The absolute same <gasps> exact f***ing words. quote. Mm-hmm. And I get banned for three days? No. F*** you, Facebook. <laughs> you bunch of dirty mother f- I'm really pissed at them. I tell you what. I got questions. I'm not going to lie. I, my first thoughts, here's where, my, here's where I'm going with this right now. I, 2016, all we heard about was what? Russia mm-hmm. interfering with Facebook and interfering with our elections, right? Yep. And it was, oh, big bad guy Russia. Yep. And now where are we at? Who is developing the first vaccine that they're going to start to market to all of us, right? Supposedly Russia. Russia. Okay. So I, I'm in this point now where I'm starting to think that Zuckerberg's Russian relationships... <laughs> Yeah. Might well, really be affecting more than anybody and knows. Trump Trump too for that matter. We'll oh, we'll absolutely. get to we'll get to Michael Cohen here in a little bit, maybe, if we got time, because I'm I'm on a roll today. Oh, it's been a week. Yep. Yeah. Uh let me continue. Last paragraph in this article, again, published by USA Today. Nanobodies in the spray are smaller than human antibodies, making them easier to manipulate in a laboratory setting, said co inventor Ashish Manglik. MD, PhD, and Assistant Professor of Pharmaceutical Chemistry. Nanobodies, for this reason, are therefore less expensive and easier to mass produce. The researchers are currently working to get the spray manufactured and clinically tested. Somebody There's does not want us to get this nasal spray. Somebody does not want that to happen. Mm-hmm. That wouldn't shock me. But I tell you what, this is just ridiculous. Facebook owes me a public apology and removal of all my strikes. I mean, that would be like the bare minimum. They owe you more than that, I think, at this point. Mm -hmm. (laughs) What I would love to do would be to get somebody at Pacifica Radio to go after them. I tell you what, folks. How did they end up in a position where they get to decide what fake news is? That's Mm -hmm. that's what I can't deal with here. Like, it's it's completely against freedom of the press. We don't have free speech already. Like, we our republic is gone friends like well, what what are we going to do here well, we're as, waiting until we can't speak <laughs> I, as i as i've said before on other shows the facebook is a privately owned company they are allowed to do whatever the f- they want so to at are this all point. of our government systems at so this point. <laughs> so here's my solution to this and this is something i believe bernie sanders might have mentioned at one point i forget who mentioned it, it was either aoc or bernie okay Time to make Facebook public utility. Thank you. Thank you. It absolutely should under, have been. Under government regulation, heavy government regulation. Yes, absolutely. Time to start regulating the rich, folks. It's time to do it. And it's past time because, again, I'm, and I'm going to tell you right now, full disclosure, I have been reading most yeah. recently The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, which was written in the 1960s. Mm-hmm. Um, just trying to kind of learn about history and see some similarities. Mm-hmm. I have to put this book down every five minutes because it's too much. Yeah. Um, I just got to a point where they're talking about how they 
first floated the idea of holding off the election and then canceled it altogether um, Mm -hmm. with Hindenburg, who was in power before Hitler. And that was basically how Hitler grabbed the amount of power that he did. It was through all of that happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so, guys, talk. We we don't have much time where we're going to have a voice when this keeps happening, when when we're losing our freedom of press, when they're trying to erase our voices. Like, we have to do something about it now or, Mm -hmm. or we're done. I mean, fascist regimes... They and, lived and, under one for years. And who's going to rescue us? <laughs> That's my point. Exactly. There is nobody to fly in with an Air Force. This is the people that we would want to rescue us are going to be the ones oppressing us. Mm-hmm. And we're not doing anything about it when we have the opportunity. What are, are we waiting for them to not let us talk, to want to say something? Yeah. Cause, yeah. <sighs> I know. It's, it's maddening. It really is. And every week I feel like it's getting worse. And it's it's more maddening when people don't see it. Like... I just, I don't know how to make people see how important it is. Mm-hmm. You can't make dumb people see. Yeah, you, you can't. can't. Yeah, it's true. You can't logic with a fool. You, you can't, you, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make it drink. And that's <sighs> pretty much where we're at with this country. Another perfect example that I'm going to get on my soapbox about and I'm going to bitch until Please do. I get some satisfaction on this. It's not just going to be Facebook I'm going after today. Remember about... Two weeks ago, it might have been on last week's show. I think it was last week we talked about it. We were talking about an article from the Detroit Metro Times about the use of biosolids in your agriculture. This is human waste teeming with diseases, with hormones. With PFAS. With PFAS. And it's going right into your wells. We've talked about examples that were in that story Cows dropping dead, people dying, people right. getting uh, MRSA. Yep. You know, this isn't stuff you want to play around with. Well, well I-, I have an idiot neighbor that's playing around with it. <sighs> so they, they used this in May. Now they're back in August after they've harvested the wheat field. Now they're injecting this, for lack of a better word, human shit into the ground. Right. Because that's just exactly what it is. Yeah. And it's human waste, and it's not treated. Oh, but it's they, they say they treat it. No, no, you don't understand how so, wastewater treatment works. They pull the water out of the shit, literally. And then just take the shit and give it to people to spread it around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, give and it to them. let me tell you another... Uh, All the farmers are clamoring for it. Yeah. Because well, they're stupid, and they don't know what they're putting on their fields. Well, it increases their yield. They don't care what they're putting on their fields. If it's increasing their yield, that's what they care about. It's their money. I tell you what, I'm going to show up to the next township meeting. By the the way, the son is the one running the property. The person that owns the property also happens to be my township clerk. That's really interesting. You know what you should ask them um, when you go in? You should Mm -hmm. bring up the water emergency that we have right now in southwestern Michigan. um, Mm -hmm. Because every city from Holland on the lakeshore all the way... Heading east. Most of Ottawa County. Yes. All the way heading east to Wyoming, Michigan. The southern half of the city of Wyoming, um, along with Hudsonville, Jenison, Holland, all the cities in between here and there, are under a water emergency right now. They have a sprinkling ban to avoid overuse of the one line that they have transferred everybody to for right now because they have a break in one of their water transmission lines. Mm -hmm. What happens when you get a break in one of your water transmission lines? You lose water pressure. And when you lose water pressure, backflow happens, which means everything gets sucked back into the drinking water from whatever source it's going out into. So if there's crap in the ground because people have been spraying it all over your agriculture Mm -hmm. and now you've got a break in your water line and nobody told you about it until the day they were going to fix it because that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Um, Who knows how long we've been drinking crap. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So here's what I'm, I'm really seriously considering. Go to the township meeting. And I'll give every member of the board two carrots. And I'm going to say, one of these was grown without using human waste. One was grown with. You want to take a bite of each one? Tell me which one's which? There you go. Let me just tell you, folks. Heinz Foods, Del Monte Foods, Dole, and Whole Foods will not buy crops that have been grown using biosolids. They will not buy them. That is their policy. I mean, I, I've i been upset about 
the agricultural world in Michigan as long as I've started looking into it because mm-hmm. I feel like farmers for too long have been protected from any liability for poisoning us. They were they no. were spreading PFAS sludge straight from Wolverine. Mm-hmm. All all of the PFAS leftover waste. They were using that to increase the yield for years. And I've every time I've brought it up on Facebook, I have been annihilated by people in the power structure trying to tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know which way the water flows, this, that, and yeah. it, they just don't want Country Fresh, Yo Play, Coca-Cola, or any of the farmers to have any sense of liability. They're, mm-hmm. they're going to put it all back on public dollars cleaning up that mess. Nope. And they'll use, they'll use the excuse, right to farm act. <sighs> because th- yeah. that's how, I'll, I'll just give you some inside baseball, because that's how the marijuana industry is trying to protect the growing of marijuana in Michigan. They're trying to get standards put together to submit to MDARD, Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. Okay. So that once those standards are in place and approved by the state, marijuana farming is now considered part of the Right to Farm Act. So Ah. you can have... That's Large. why they want to make sure they're saving a bunch of agricultural areas, too, so they can grow the weed there. Mm-hmm. Which, if you're going to use and, farmland and, for something, it should probably be something we're smoking, not something we're eating. And by, <laughs> and by the way, once they do that, I'm just going to fill you in. Once it's on Right to Farm Act, Townships cannot ban large growth farms of marijuana. Oh, no. They're going to own them all. They won't want to ban oh. them. <laughs> oh, well, my township banned marijuana. Right, right. I think everybody's doing that right now, and I think most of the reason is because they want to own it. They don't want well, anything coming through until they've got it completely let, under their let me control. Fill you, let me fill you in on where I live. I live around a bunch of hillbilly farmers that are old and they don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> My opinion. Sorry. No. If you don't if you don't like it, you can f*** off. <laughs> There's another one. That's the Darren I know. That's that's another one right there. And this is why he gets banned from Facebook. <laughs> this is, this is why... <laughs> You know, you know why I got a 24-hour ban? Why? Because I made a comment on a post about how dirty men were. Wow. Which, sorry, I'm a man. I know how dirty I am. Right? Hello? Any, I mean, I... Any, anybody listening to this? <laughs> Jeez. Unbelievable. Oh. Yeah, yeah, Facebook's a bunch of Nazis. By the way, I've already started a MeWe account, so... Go to MeWe.com, download their app, and you can find me there if you really want to look. I'm thinking about paying the uh, $1.99 a month to put Southpaws on the MeWe app. I see. I don't I don't know anything about MeWe. Yeah, that's a uh, alternative to Facebook. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm thinking I need an alternative, like no alternative at this point. And, eh? and I'm also giving very serious consideration because I've got the cash now. Time to get a website for the show. Yeah, if you can, I wouldn't. I I definitely agree. It's a good time. As fast as everything is happening, I feel like they're consolidating media so fast. Mm. I, there was what like six people that owned all of it. The last time I looked, it's probably like two now. Six, six people own ninety ninety <laughs> percent of the TV stations in the country. I uh, I just feel like that was even a few weeks old, so it could be and, less and, than and, that. And by the way, I I keep trying to explain this to my mother because she's just. She doesn't really quite understand any of this. State news. I mean, this is how fascist dictatorships begin. I mean. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Because right now, Scripps Media is having issues with Dish Network. They're in an argument over paying for rebroadcast rights. Well, in this area, it's affecting the local Fox affiliate, which is WXMI 17. Because they're owned by Scripps. Where my aunt lives in Kentucky is affecting the Lexington market because Scripps owns WLEX, which is the NBC affiliate. Uh. So my mom and her sister talk all the time on the phone and can't they don't get it. It's like, well, why is... I've got NBC up here. Why don't you have it? I'm like it's because it's who owns the station. It's not the it's not the network. It's the station owner. Yeah, that is really confusing for people that don't mm-hmm. know anything about radio because you don't realize they're separate. You assume mm-hmm. that NBC is the station owner. Yeah. <laughs> well, you would think that people would. Every station. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> Let me give you an example. WABC in New York. Mm-hmm. The, the the not the TV station. The radio station WABC. Okay. 
Who do you think owns that? No idea. If you listen to the call letters, what would you assume? W A B C. Yeah. Um, would be ABC Radio. Yeah, ABC Network. For- yeah. Well, well, it isn't. They used to own it. They don't anymore. Uh, I believe. I believe Inter- uh, Intercom owns it. No, not Intercom. Intercom bought up all of CBS. I want to say it's Cumulus Media, possibly uh, iHeartRadio. I'll have uh, to double check on that. That's Clear Communications, right? Yeah, um, yeah, iHeart, yeah, uh, Clear Channel, yeah. Clear Channel Communications. What, what used to be Clear Channel, or as Rick Beckett used to call them, Cheap Channel. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking speaking of which, we're we're going to detour from our normal routine here. Mentioning Rick Beckett reminded me. Uh, we had a passing a few weeks ago in the local community. Oh, yeah. The great Daryl Nathan, who Rick used to talk about on his radio show all the time and got amused by watching <laughs> the great Daryl Nathan on GRTV. Uh, <laughs> there's only there's usually only a handful of people, I would say, in, in a lifetime that can get the kind of notoriety. <laughs> um, that, and, and a, you know, within a community like that, without having some... You know, mm-hmm. money behind you or having something like that. So it's bittersweet to um, have known who he was and gotten to... Uh... Yeah, WABC AM Radio 770 in New York City is owned by Red Apple Media Incorporated. Uh, the guy's name is John Katsimatidis. Wow, okay. That's a mouthful there. Right. But yeah, when that station started, that used to be owned by the American Broadcasting Company. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, so, yeah, so just real quick, uh, passing our condolences to the family of the great Daryl Nathan. Yes, rest in peace. And and if you want to see why he made such a name in the Grand Rapids area, go to YouTube and just yes, do a search do for it. him. Do it. Do it. You won't and regret it's, it. It's Daryl is D A R Y L one L. So make sure you check that out. <laughs> It's something else. Yeah, these are the things that that we need good history, like local history writers for, because somebody better put a chapter about Daryl in the book when they when they talk about these years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I actually I want to get to this story. A friend of mine posted this on his Facebook, and this is some good reading here. Wade Davis published this for Rolling Stone magazine on August sixth. Wayne Davis holds the leadership chair in cultures and ecosystems at risk at the University of British Columbia. His award-winning books include Into the Silence and The Wayfinders. His new book, Magdalena, River of Dreams, is published by Knopf. So here's what Wayne Davis had to write. Never in our times have we experienced such a global phenomenon. For the first time in the history of the world, all of humanity, informed by the unprecedented reach of digital technology, has come together, focused on the same existential threat, consumed by the same fears and uncertainties, eagerly anticipating the same as yet unrealized promises of medical science. In a single season, civilization has been brought woe by a microscopic parasite 10,000 times smaller than a grain of salt. COVID-19 attacks our physical bodies, but also the cultural foundation of our lives, the toolbox of community and connectivity that is for the human what claws and teeth represent to the tiger. Our interventions to date have largely focused on mitigating the rate of spread, flattening the curve of morbidity. There is no treatment at hand and no certainty of a vaccine on the near horizon. The fastest vaccine ever developed was for mumps. It took four years. COVID-19 killed 100,000 Americans in four months. There is some evidence that natural infection may not imply immunity, leaving some to question how effective a vaccine will be, even assuming one can be found. And it must be safe. If the global population is to be immunized, lethal complications in just one person in a thousand would imply the death of millions. Pandemics and plagues have a way of shifting the course of history, and not always in a manner immediately evident to the survivors. In the 14th century, the Black Death killed close to half of Europe's population. A scarcity of labor led to increased wages. Rising expectations culminated in the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, an inflection point that marked the beginning of the end of the feudal order that had dominated medieval Europe for a thousand years. The COVID pandemic will be remembered as such a moment in history, 
a seminal event whose significance will unfold only in the wake of the crisis. It will mark this era much as the 1914 assassination of Archduke Ferdinand, the stock market crash of 1929, and the 1933 ascent of Adolf Hitler became fundamental benchmarks of the last century, all harbingers of greater and more consequential outcomes. So this wow, ripples, that folks. Is, yes, that's really... Uh... That was some good information. First of all, I love. I'm a person that likes the big picture. I do a lot. Of, I read a lot of history, um, but I don't generally go all the way back to the 14th century. So that's really mm-hmm. good to know that there are some. Yeah, it's like dropping a rock in a pool of water. You're going to have ripples. Oh yeah, for out. sure. And this is. I was thinking this morning, coronavirus. The only thing I can think of in my lifetime that compares to this moment is probably 9/11, mm-hmm. when we all felt everything just stop and change. Yes. But even this is a bigger scale. It is. COVID's historic significance lies not in what it implies for our daily lives. Change, after all, is the one constant when it comes to culture. All peoples and all places at all times are always dancing with new possibilities for life. As companies eliminate or downsize central offices, employees work from home, restaurants close, shopping malls shutter, streaming brings entertainment and sporting events into the home, and airline travel becomes even more problematic and miserable People will adapt, as we've always done. Fluidity of memory and a capacity to forget is perhaps the most haunting trait of our species. As history confirms, it allows us to come to terms with any degree of social, moral, or environmental degradation. Yes. To be sure, financial uncertainty will cast a long shadow. Hovering over the global economy for some time will be the sober realization that all the money in the hands of all the nations on Earth will never be enough to offset the losses sustained when an entire world ceases to function, with workers and businesses everywhere facing a choice between economic and biological survival. Unsettling as these transitions and circumstances will be, short of a complete economic collapse, nothing stands out as a turning point in history. But what surely does is the absolutely devastating impact that the pandemic has had on the reputation and international standing of the United States of America. Yes, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. In a dark season of pestilence, COVID has reduced to tatters the illusion of American exceptionalism. At the height of the crisis, with more than 2,000 dying each day, Americans found themselves members of a failed state ruled by a dysfunctional and incompetent government largely responsible for death rates that added to a tragic coda to America's claim to supremacy in the world. For the first time, the international community felt compelled to send disaster relief to Washington. For more than two centuries, reported the Irish Times, the United States has stirred a very wide range of feelings in the rest of the world. Love and hatred, fear and hope, envy and contempt, awe and anger. But there is one emotion that has never been directed toward the U.S. until now. Pity. Yes. As American doctors and nurses eagerly awaited emergency airlifts of basic supplies from China, the hinge of history opened to the Asian century. No empire long endures, even if few anticipate their demise. Every kingdom is born to die. The 15th century belonged to the Portuguese, the 16th to Spain, 17th to the Dutch, France dominated the 18th and Britain the 19th. Blood white and left bankrupt by the Great War, the British maintained a pretense of domination as late as 1935 when the empire reached its greatest geographical extent. By then, of course, the torch had long passed into the hands of America. Wow, that is, I mean, that just gave me chills because that's so true. I never realized that. I always, Mm -hmm. America in my lifetime has always been the one that, always got that title but wow. yeah exactly but it, things have changed yeah. in 1940 with europe already ablaze the united states had a smaller army than either portugal or bulgaria within four years 18 million men and women would serve in uniform with millions more working double shifts in mines and factories that made america as president roosevelt promised the arsenal of democracy <laughs> When the Japanese, within six weeks of Pearl Harbor, took control of 90% of the world's rubber supply, the U.S. dropped the speed limit to 35 miles per hour to protect tires, and then in three years, 
He invented from scratch a synthetic rubber industry what? that allowed airline armies to roll over the Nazis. No way. Three years. I didn't even know that. Okay. Yeah. At its peak, Henry Ford's Willow Run plant produced a B-24 Liberator every two hours around the clock. Shipyards in Long Beach and Sausalito spat out Liberty ships at the rate of two a day for four years. The record was a ship built in four days, 15 hours, and 29 minutes. A single American factory, Chrysler's Detroit Arsenal, built more tanks than the whole of the Third Reich. In the wake of the war, with Europe and Japan in ashes, the United States, with but 6% of the world's population, accounted for half of the global economy, including the production of 93% of all automobiles globally. Such economic dominance birthed a vibrant middle class, a trade union movement that allowed a single breadwinner with limited education to own a home and a car, support a family, and send his kids to good schools. It was not by any means a perfect world, but affluence allowed for a truce between capital and labor, a reciprocity of opportunity in a time of rapid growth and declining income inequality, marked by high tax rates for the wealthy, who were by no means the only beneficiaries of a golden age of American capitalism. Yeah, yep. pe people forget the rich used to pay 91%. Yep. yep. Under Eisenhower, folks. <laughs> Eisenhower was only 60, 70 years ago. <sighs> Did I show you the, the bookmark I found this week? I remember I pulled it out of a, yeah. a book I got in an estate sale. It was a receipt. For a dentist's office, it was 1941, and the bill was two dollars. Two dollars to go to the dentist. Two dollars. I mean, I think in, of that in perspective. And that was early 1941. Wages. That was before yeah the U.S. involvement in World War II. Right. Oh, I. But yeah, that was basically <laughs> what the story Darren just recited is basically how the U.S. destroyed the planet in you know 20 years, big mm -hmm. industry and war. <sighs> but freedom of affluence came with a price. The United States, virtually a demilitarized nation on the eve of the Second World War, never stood down in the wake of victory. To this day, American troops are deployed in 150 countries. Yep. Since the 1970s, China has not once gone to war. The U.S. has not spent a day at peace. President Jimmy Carter recently noted that in its history... America has enjoyed only 16 years of peace, making it, as he wrote, quote, the most warlike nation in the history of the world, end of quote. Mic drop. That is former President Jimmy Carter, who I have said is the best president in my lifetime. Oh, yeah. The by best far. one to have existed, as far as I can tell in researching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Since 2001, the U.S. has spent over $6 trillion on military operations and war. Money that might have been invested in the infrastructure of home. Exactly. China, meanwhile, built its nation, pouring more cement every three years than America did in the entire 20th century. Wow. So every three years, take... Wow. All of the development we've done in the 20th century. No. Yeah, exactly. As America policed the world, the violence came home. On D-Day, June 6, 1944, the Allied death toll was 4,414. In 2019, domestic gun violence had killed that many American men and women by the end of April. By June of that year, guns in the hands of ordinary Americans had caused more casualties than the Allies suffered in Normandy in the first month of a campaign that consumed the military strength of five nations. Just think about that, folks. More than any other country, the United States in the post-war era lionized the individual at the expense of community and family. And I can tell you who ramped that up big time, Ronald Reagan. Reagan. It was the sociological equivalent of splitting the atom. What was gained in terms of mobility and personal freedom came at the expense of common purpose. In wide swaths of America, the family as an institution lost its grounding. By the 1960s, 40% of marriages were ending in divorce. Only 6% of American homes had grandparents living beneath the same roof as grandchildren. Elders were abandoned to retirement homes. With slogans like 24-7 celebrating complete dedication to the workplace, men and women exhausted themselves in jobs that only reinforced their isolation from their families. 
The average American father spends less than 20 minutes a day in direct communication with his child. By the time a youth reaches 18, he or she will have spent fully two years watching television or staring at a laptop screen, contributing to an obesity epidemic that the Joint Chiefs have called a national security crisis. Only half of Americans report having meaningful face-to-face social interactions on a daily basis. The nation consumes two-thirds of the world's production of antidepressant drugs. Mm-hmm. And Me, guess where the most of, of the depressed people in the United States are at? Right here in West Michigan. Mm-hmm. Yep, and we've reported on that within the last year or so. The collapse of the working class family has been responsible in part for an opioid crisis that has displaced car accidents as the leading cause of death for Americans under 50. At the root of this transformation and decline lies an ever-widening chasm between Americans who have and those who have little or nothing. Economic disparities exist in all nations, creating a tension that can be as disruptive as the inequities are unjust. In any number of settings, however, the negative forces tearing apart a society are mitigated or even muted if there are other elements that reinforce social solidarity, (laughs) religious faith, the strength and comfort of family, the pride of tradition, fidelity to the land, a spirit of place. But we're in a world now where not only are none of those things here, but we've got all of the other things happening at once. Mm -hmm. But when all the old certainties are shown to be lies, when the promise of a good life for a working family is shattered as factories close and corporate leaders growing wealthier by the day ship jobs abroad, the social contract is irrevocably broken. Mm -hmm. For two generations, America has celebrated globalization with iconic intensity when, as any working man or woman can see, it's nothing more than capital on the prowl in search of ever cheaper sources of labor. For many years, those on the conservative right in the United States have invoked a nostalgia for the 1950s and an America that never was, but has to be presumed to have existed to rationalize their sense of loss and abandonment, their fear of change, their bitter resentments and lingering contempt for the social movements of the 1960s, a time of new aspirations for women, gays, and people of color. Yep. In, In truth, at least in economic terms, The country of the 1950s resembled Denmark as much as the America of today. Marginal tax rates for the wealthy were 90%. The salaries of CEOs were, on average, just 20 times that of their mid-management employees. Today, the base pay of those at the top is commonly 400 times that of their salaried staff, with many earning orders of magnitude more in stock options and perks. The elite 1% of Americans control $30 trillion of assets, while the bottom half have more debt than assets. The three richest Americans have more money than the poorest 160 million of their countrymen. Fully a fifth of American households have zero or negative net worth, a figure that rises to 37% for black families. The median wealth of black households is a tenth that of whites. The vast majority of Americans, white, black, and brown, are two paychecks removed from bankruptcy. Though living in a nation that celebrates itself as the wealthiest in history, most Americans live on a high wire with no safety net to brace a fall. With the COVID crisis, 40 million Americans lost their jobs and 3.3 million businesses shut down, including 41% of all black-owned enterprises. Black Americans who significantly outnumber whites in federal prisons despite being but 13% of the population are suffering shockingly high rates of morbidity and mortality, dying at nearly three times the rate of white Americans. Which is not shocking when you look at how we are treating people. It's Mm -hmm. not shocking at all. Yep. The only group that's seeing more morbidity, mortality, are Native Americans. Yes, we have f***ed the Indians over again. We're at a point we'll now. We'll just say it. We're at a point now where the, I think very few people have avoided escaping consequences of the actions of our our leaders. Mm-hmm. Let me continue here. The carnal rule of American social policy. Don't let any ethnic group get below the blacks or allow anyone to suffer more indignities rang true even in a pandemic as if the virus was taking its cues from American history. Yep. 
COVID-19 didn't lay America low. It simply revealed what had long been forsaken. As the crisis unfolded with another American dying every minute of every day, a country that once turned out fighter planes by the hour could not manage to produce the paper masks or cotton swabs essential for tracking the disease. The nation that defeated smallpox and polio and led the world for generations in medical innovation and discovery was reduced to a laughingstock as a buffoon of a president advocated the use of household disinfectants as a treatment for a disease that intellectually he could not begin to understand. Truth. Well, although Trump did say, I get this stuff. It's amazing. I get this stuff. Yeah. But I mean, honestly, I, at that same time, I wonder how many of those investment funds he's got his hand in because that's why we weren't manufacturing the stuff here because mm-hmm. these guys were making their money off just investing in the places that were manufacturing it in China. Mm-hmm. As a number of countries moved expeditiously to contain the virus, the United States stumbled along in denial as if willfully blind. And by the way, they still are. Mm-hmm. Just listen to your... Local Republican talk about how masks are ineffective and spread the disease, which is absolute bullshit. Don't listen to your local Republicans at all. Do yourself a favor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I accidentally clicked on one's Facebook yesterday, and he <laughs> he was talking about how he decided to Google Antifa, you know, just to see what they were about. And he found this website, which was a satirical website, but he didn't get it. <laughs> Okay, so then he posted the link and was telling everybody that, you know, this is what the new DNC is, and guys, we need a revolution, and I'm like, uh, I don't think you got the joke, dude. No. <laughs> so don't don't listen to them, they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. With less than 4% of the global population, the U.S. soon accounted for more than a fifth of COVID deaths. The percentage of American victims of the disease who died was six times the global average. Achieving the world's highest rate of morbidity and mortality provoked not shame, but only further lies, scapegoating, and boasts of miracle cures as dubious as the claims of a carnival barker, a grifter on the make. As the United States responded to the crisis like a corrupt tin pot dictatorship, the actual tin pot dictators of the world took the opportunity to seize the high ground, relishing a rare sense of moral superiority, especially in the wake of the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. The autocratic leader of Chechnya, Ramzan Kadyrov, chastised America for, quote, maliciously violating ordinary citizens' rights, end of quote. North Korean newspapers objected to police brutality in America. Wow. Quoted in the Iranian press, Ayatollah Khamenei gloated, quote, America has begun the process of its own destruction, end of quote. Trump's performance in America's crisis deflected attention from China's own mishandling of the initial outbreak in Wuhan, not to mention its move to crush democracy in Hong Kong. When an American official raised the issue of human rights on Twitter, China's foreign ministry spokesperson invoking the killing of George Floyd responded with one short phrase, quote, I can't breathe, end of quote. How did I not even read that? These politically motivated remarks may be easy to dismiss, but Americans have not done themselves any favors. Their political process made possible the ascendancy to the highest office in the land, a national disgrace, a demagogue as morally and ethically compromised as a person can be. As a British writer quipped, quote, There have always been stupid people in the world and plenty of nasty people too, but rarely has stupidity been so nasty or nastiness so stupid. End of quote. The American president lives to cultivate resentments, demonize his opponents, validate hatred. His main tool of governance is the lie. As of July 9, 2020, the documented tally of his distortions and false statements numbered 20,055. If America's first president, George Washington, famously could not tell a lie, the current one can't recognize the truth. Inverting the words and sentiments of Abraham Lincoln... This dark troll of a man celebrates malice for all and charity for none. Odious as he may be, Trump is less the cause of America's decline than a product of its descent. As they stare into the mirror and perceive only the myth of their exceptionalism, Americans remain almost bizarrely incapable of seeing what has actually become of their country. The republic that defined the free flow of information as the lifeblood of democracy 
Today ranks 45th among nations when it comes to press freedom. In a land that once welcomed the huddled masses of the world, more people today favor building a wall along the southern border than supporting health care and protection for the undocumented mothers and children arriving in desperation at its doors. In a complete abandonment of the collective good, U.S. laws define freedom as an individual's inalienable right to own a personal arsenal of weaponry, a natural entitlement that trumps even the safety of children. In the past decade alone, 346 American students and teachers have been shot on school grounds. The American cult of the individual denies not just community, but the very idea of society. No one owes anything to anyone. All must be prepared to fight for everything, education, shelter, food, medical care. What every prosperous and successful democracy deems to be fundamental rights, universal health care, equal access to quality public education, a social safety net for the weak, elderly, and infirmed, America dismisses as socialist indulgences as if so many signs of weakness. And this just, it goes on. This is a very lengthy piece, and we're starting to run low on time. So we've got that up on our Facebook page, so make sure you check it out. I will definitely read the rest of that. That's some good information. Again, that's Wade Davis writing for Rolling Stone magazine. And we might as well mention, speaking of single-payer universal health care, we're not going to see that anytime soon (sighs) from either side of the aisle, as Joe Biden has picked Kamala Harris as his running mate. Y'all, okay, (laughs) here's the thing. (laughs) Yeah? Number one, a thousand percent, we got to get rid of Trump, right? And and do I completely believe that, you know, the election's going to not be messed with or anything is not going to, I don't know. I know that we all have to go out and do what we can to vote against Trump, right? Mm -hmm. That's a pretense to what I'm about to say right now. Yep. Write down the time because f*** Joe Biden and Kamala Harris okay oh jeez. <laughs> I am I am s- disappointed doesn't really it just doesn't sum this up I did I heard a great joke the other day that I'm still laughing and I'm laughing with shame because mm-hmm. it it's just so ridiculous that we're in a place where this is funny <laughs> and this is true so their their campaign motto <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh it's so good Darren I want to sign in my front yard okay Kappa feel oh my god that's funny that's very funny if if they didn't have photos of this man you know actually putting his hands in places all over women and children that he shouldn't that wouldn't be a joke that anybody really laughed at right but Mm -hmm. the fact that he is now the nominee for the democratic party to be our next president yeah and that's what we're up against we have to put his record up against Donald Trump's, which to me is just, what are we going to do, you guys? (laughs) Just comparing cow manure to horse manure. Yeah, like just comparing those two things. People are going to think we might be okay with one of them. Oh, God. (sighs) I don't know. This country's gone to hell in a handbasket. It's not going there. We're already there. And some of you need to wake up. Tell you what, folks. After you listen to this podcast... You need to go to YouTube and you need to find George Carlin greatest three minute routine. We don't have time to play here. It's worth it. We'll tell you who owns this country because they don't give a damn about you. Mm-hmm. They really don't. I know. They bought the private sector and now they're stealing the public sector. So. Yeah. The stations that carry Southpaws do not necessarily share the opinions expressed on the show. Southpaws is protected by the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and is copyrighted by Big D Entertainment. All rights reserved. And that's going to wrap things up for this week. We'll be back next week. I'm Darren Gibson. I'm Katie Steele Brody. For Kristen Cook, please support independent media and the First Amendment. <laughs>